Hello everyone, welcome to Making Theatre with New Technologies. I'm Levana Sheher. I'm here associated with Mousetrap Theatre Projects and I'm a volunteer today. Hi everyone, I'm Steph. I'm a customer experience manager with a passion for theatre and I'm really excited to be here today with Mousetrap and Theatrecraft. Um, last year we had a panel talk about technical theatre, so this year we're going to talk about how uh, technology can be used in new ways and today we have three experts here who are going to talk to you about that. Um, can they please introduce themselves? Hello, uh, my name is Emma Wilson. I'm the Director of Technical Production and Costume here at the Royal Opera House. Hi, my name's Tony Gale. I'm a freelance sound designer and also co-director of Stage Sight. And my name's Jason Larkham. I'm a project manager with a, a technical production company called White Light. Uh, first of all, we're going to have Emma talk about a little bit about her work. So, hello. Um, I um, am head of the technical production and costume department here, so we do everything from the digital drawing at the beginning of the process through to presenting the show on stage and then putting it into storage afterwards. And I thought what I'd do is talk through some of the um, new technologies that we use and emerging technologies that we use actually in the presentation uh, of productions here specifically. So you can see that kind of, you know, very theatre-based um, aspect of, of new technologies. And, and I think the guys are going to talk about how we take that out and beyond the theatre after me. I'm going to talk a little bit about automation, uh, which is... Um, uh, about the fly system that we have here. So we've got it here in the limber, we've got it on the main stage as well. Um, and that is um, by Tate Engineering. Um, and that allows us to do um, automated movements, uh, which I'm sure many of you, if you're at, at college at the moment, are aware of. Um, it also uh, allows us to do automated movements on stage as well. So we've just had a production uh, called Theodora, which had a, a series of boxes, rooms, that moved across the stage, and that was all tied in with the flies. So we're now starting to see automation talk to each other across different areas as well um, of the stage. Uh, another way in which that was tied in <coughs> was uh, we also tied it in with uh, projection as well. So we had um, a projector out front, which was doing a lot of the lighting in the show, um, and that was tied into the same software that was controlling the movement of the stage and the flies' movements as well. So we could have lighting tracking along with our automated movements as well. So that was projection mapping, if you like, coming in on top of automation. Um, another area that we're looking at greatly is visualization, lighting visualization. Um, so that's uh, a whole area which we are very, very, very pressed for time here in terms of schedule. Um, we have on the main stage uh, a different show most nights um, and a different rehearsal most afternoons. So we spend the morning turning around from um, whatever was on the previous night. Um, and then we'll go into a whole session of three, four hours of rehearsal. Then we'll take it out and then we'll go into another session in the evening of a different performance. So there's this constant churn. We spend 51% of our time moving sets around and moving scenery around and getting ready for the next thing. And this is largely driven by opera because opera, you can't sing the same role two nights running. Um, because it strains the voice. It's a bit like being an athlete. You can't run the 100 metres final two days running. So it's exactly the same process, really. Um, so because of that steady churn over, <clears throat> we have quite limited technical time, which means our lighting um, uh, programmers have limited time at the desk. To enable us to uh, work through that, we have a lot of lighting visualisation. So we're starting to work a lot on visualisation uh, with a visualisation suite. We're building that hopefully in the future. And we're about to go to an LED lighting rig in about two years' time, uh, which is uh, a full wholesale replacement of everything um, which, was, uh, which is overhead, which got a fixed rig largely, which is supplemented day to day on the main stage. And that will enable us to hopefully do a lot of our prep and a lot of our, our work in advance. So that's ramping up, again, the, the, the visualisation. Um, so those are kind of um, areas of new technology. I'm really um, sorry I can't show you the slides, but it appears the wrong slideshow's uh, there at the moment. Um, if we can get to that before uh, the end, I'll, I'll run through those slides. Um, <clears throat> and the other area which is particularly uh, good for us is, is uh, drafting as well, digital drawing. So this is another huge area. And all of these areas tie in together. The digital drawing ties in with the visualisation because actually the more accurately we have uh, rendered um, uh, drawings, the more accurately we can actually do lighting visualisation in advance. Um, and obviously that feeds into the automation design as well. So these are the, you know, the main sort of key areas that we have um, 
uh, in terms of new technologies that we're really investing in the next two or three years as well. Um, I'll just leave stage while the other two are delivering, see if we can find a slideshow for you, um, and I'll just hand over to Tony. I said earlier, my name's Tony Gale, I'm a freelance sound designer, uh, predominantly in commercial theatre, um, musical theatre to be precise, um, and also co-director of Stage Sight, um, who work with getting more diversity into backstage roles in theatre, um, backstage and offstage. So, um, as a freelance sound designer working on commercial shows, obviously when the pandemic hit, um, commercial theatre well, well, you know, came to an end, was stopped, was, was on pause for, for, the obvious, for obvious reasons. And, but because we're in a creative industry, we, we try to find out how we can continue creating theatre and delivering theatre, um, predominantly so they can keep on making money, but then also to um, deliver art um, to the masses. Um, and one of the main things that came out of the pandemic, and it happened before, but pandemic, everyone sort of jumped on it, was um, live streaming. Um, and I'm sure everyone here at, in a the theatre and online have seen a show or a programme that was live streamed. Um, some of them are pre-recorded, some of them as, as live, um, but predominantly um, they are put on not for streaming purposes, but for a, a theatre production, and then streaming come, in, comes in afterwards. So um, what happened was we had to adapt quite a lot of the way we've done our work, especially as a sound designer, specifically for a sound designer, because obviously I'm used to sound, sound design and designing a system for people in the auditorium, so they have an experience of hearing it directly from a speaker that's in front of them or near them. Um, and now I have to now think about how that's going to translate into a, a two speakers on, on, on a laptop or you know, a surround system at someone's home cinema system. So already you're thinking about, okay, I need to think about the, the majority of people who are watching this or listening to this. And so my, um, my thought process had to change. Um, I had to think about the end user and not you know, what is going on stage. So you know, lots of technology came into that. You know, I had to learn new te technology really quickly. Um, you know, stream, streaming decks, also um, finding out about, you know, um, latency, um, you know, cause when you see something live, how, what is the latency like for audio, you know, it's syncing up with pictures as well. Um, you know, people in the film industry do it all the time, but this was all new to me. And so, you know, so the streaming element of it became very important because ultimately we were delivering a service um, and the main, thing that, um, the main thing that I took away from doing the streaming services was that learning a different way of, of making art and, and making a different, way of, a different way of doing sound design for what I predominantly do. Because I thought I didn't know how to sound design for you know, a laptop or a Zoom call or, or you know, a pre-record. But quickly you start to realise that there's different approaches you have to take to make it translate. You know, and that, that, that talks of, even thinking about you know using different equipment, um, using equipment that I would never ever think I would need to use in a live theatre environment, but you need to use it because it's uh, you know it's been recorded, and so therefore um, the quality is different, um, and the time time scale is is different as well. Normally, when you're going to a theatre production, sometimes you have two to three weeks of technical rehearsals. Um, you, now you've got to incorporate camera rehearsals. Um, you know. Uh, getting cameras, getting syncs, audio to sync with, with shots. So the process sort of um, basically make, becomes a, a longer um, and you have to have the patience for that. And it's not, you know, it's because it's live, it has to work straight away. You know, it doesn't always go right, but you know, when it does, it's a fantastic thing. But um, the thing to remember about live streaming is that it's very much, the way I look at it is, it's very much we're delivering a 2D, a 2D um, version of a 3D show. So, you know, um, and the best way to try and translate that is by using the technology that's available to you. Um, you know, and that would be editing software, um, um, uh, multi-track recordings, you know, and mixing live as per, um, as per for live streaming and, and for shows. So it was a new way of working and it was a new bit of technology to me anyway that um, I think is now here to stay. Um, I don't ever think it will replace live theatre or 3D theatre or 4D theatre, but it will definitely have a place um, 
in, in, the, in the future and it, it will work alongside because it, it also makes theatre accessible to so many more people, um, which, you know, which is so satisfying for me because it means that you know, people, no matter where you are in the world, um, can see your work. And that's important because, you know, theatre should be enjoyed by everyone, no matter if you can afford it or not. So the streaming technology over the last two, three years has been absolutely, I mean, phenomenal. It's, 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 it's grown and grown. I think every production now thinks about streaming a, streaming a performance, whether you're a small fringe theatre or you're a big commercial, because once you have that archive, you know you can keep theatre going. Even when the buildings are shut, you can still produce theatre and still bring theatre to the masses. Um, and just keeping, keeping that awareness of, you know, there are creative people out there making theatre and you know, creative industry is still viable and still working. So yeah, so, so streaming for me is uh, a massive technology that we, I think, is here to stay and the future of theatre. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Well, hopefully my presentation will pop on in a minute. Um, one of the things I think what, what, what's great is that both Emma and, uh, and Tony have picked up on some very, very key things, which is digital, that word, the, that, that, that world that we're going into. Uh, when I first started in theatre too many years ago, uh, uh, as a sort of apprentice lighting and then moving into lighting design and so on, I remember m most of my job was spent uh, taking plans for productions that were arriving from, arriving from the States, coming to London, and having to take a set of plans, doing some modifications and FedExing them back, uh, FedExing them back the next day, getting another set of plans the next day and so on, and that process continued and continued for weeks as we were preparing and developing a show. And now, with digital, we can basically do whatever we want uh, and make that process really, really quick, and we can basically uh, cut down an awful lot of the time whilst also opening up a lot more opportunities. So now starting in digital is not just about what it can do for the theatre production, but also what it can do when you break outside of this. And hopefully, if, uh, if I can let a video run on the background, and the, I, I must uh, say thank you also to some friends of ours at Preview, who we work with an awful lot to have shared these with, with us. Because basically what I'm saying here is it by starting in digital, and this is basically a, a LiDAR scan of an auditorium. And what LiDAR scan, scanning means is it takes millions and millions and millions of photographs effectively or, or co uh, computations of a particular space and then pulls them all together into a piece of software which enables you to get millimeter accuracy of the actual venue itself or whatever it is that you're actually taking. But once you've got that information, it gives you an awful lot more opportunity to be able to take it to the next level and hopefully if, I can, if we go on to the next slide, you'll start seeing, and then another one will start running, which is a, a, another walkthrough or fly through of a space. But basically, once you have that uh, detail in millimeter accuracy, you can then start using it for some of the things that uh, Emma mentioned in terms of automation and flying and knowing exactly where people are in 3D space, for lighting visualization, visualization and being able to use the toolkit to allow the lighting designers A, to speed up the process, but also to ensure that you have the light in exactly the right place, pointing in exactly the right position on the stage, and therefore doing a lot of that pre-production and planning well before you actually get into the venue itself. So I think that, that, you know, that is opening up a huge amount of new opportunities once you get into this particular field. And as you can see behind, this is of this uh, uh, of Chichester Festival Theatre, and it's a fully rendered a 3D scan. So effectively, it looks like the theatre looks in real life. And then we can start taking that and being able to do an awful lot more things both in the theatre, but also outside the theatre as well. Because one of the things that really, really interests me in our sort of next iteration of where theatre is going to go and where the creative and cultural industries are going to go is what you can do now. We hear things like the metaverse, and we hear, oh, that's just for gaming. But the metaverse, digital twins, gives us an opportunity to be really, really creative in a very, very different world. I'm not understating the importance of the live performance, but there are now opportunities to marry both live performance and digital performance together as well. And things like the metaverse, things like digital twins give us the opportunity to do that. And one such project that we did recently was something with Chichester Festival Theatre called Digital Stages, where effectively we took uh, the 3D real-time uh, scan of Chichester Festival Theatre and we placed it on one of our XR broadcast studios. White Light has something called Smart Stage. It was a product that was developed initially for broadcast, but we are now working on a lot of different 
uh, projects in the creative industries, both in dance, drama, etc., where we're, we're, we're taking the technology and being able to use real-time uh, solutions to offer a completely different style of performance or style of presentation, whether that might be for corporate or theatre or whatever. So this is a small little video um, uh, that hopefully we'll play, which we need the audio on for, which just explains a bit about digital stages. And hopefully it will play now. No, it doesn't play. Have we got any way to get this to play? No? OK, well, wait, maybe we better come back to that. Um, the other thing that I was going to pick up on was the creative workflow. Because I think from the perspective of people that are coming into the industry now, yourselves, and being able to grow your careers, there's a lot more opportunity than perhaps there was 10 to 15 years ago. And there's a lot more opportunity to use a wide range of different skills. So starting in digital gives you the potential to be able to, um, the potential to be able to use the same set of information, the same plans, et cetera, to collaborate, whether you're in the scenic department, whether you're in the lighting department, whether you're, whether you're on, in the automation department, or whether you're in the production management department or audio department, as, um, as Tony is, in terms of being able to do full 3D soundscapes of a show. But once you've got that content, you then collaborate. And the great thing about this technology is the fact that you can collaborate in a shared space, all using exactly the same medium. So you're all working effectively real time on the same documents and in real time on the same plans. And therefore, if I make an adjustment on, on, on a plan and, uh, and say, I want my light to go there, Tony will then automatically see that and say, oh, no, you, I, my speaker's already there, so there's no way you can put your light there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, therefore, it means we can start making decisions really, really quickly and easily. And a lot of the time, collaborative teams are not all based in one building. They're based throughout the world. They have to come from different parts of the world to be able to come together to put, put a production on. And therefore, it's not so easy if you're having to do uh, calls and, and do specific meetings with people all the time on dedicated bits of information to make, uh, to make updates very, very quick and, uh, quick and easy. Whereas everybody's working together, maybe working together in augmented reality or in some places in virtual reality to see a stage, to make a decision on where a set might go, uh, to make a decision on where the seats might be positioned in order to get the best sight lines, et cetera, et cetera. All those collaborative discussions which go on early on in the workflow, it makes it then therefore much, much simpler for people to be able to work on multiple productions at the same time, which is what a lot of um, professionals are now doing. So collaboration becomes the opportunity. Then we move into realization, um, which basically means if you've got a real-time plan or a real-time 3D digital twin, then whatever you do in that real-time digital tw twin, in theory, should be accurately uh, and exactly replicated on stage. Because if you're, if you're taking a, 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 um, a, a replica of, of millimeter accuracy of your stage, and then you, you basically do whatever you want in the, in the uh, virtual or digital environment to manipulate your uh, your environment, your set, your lights, etc., and then place that back in real time onto the stage, it should fit perfectly. Should. Doesn't always, but should fit perfectly. Um, therefore, you have that opportunity to be able to really, really reduce the amount of contact time it takes with the stage, as Emma mentioned earlier on, what, therefore allowing more productions to go on, reducing your costs in operating the, uh, operating the venue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then finally, archive. One of the key things about something like this is that there are a lot more opportunities with this type of technology than just, um, just the theatre and just putting on the presentation. You have an accurate representation of your building from a maintenance point of view. For example, if the building burnt down, you could quite easily build the building again from the accurate set of models that you already have. You can also archive your shows to bring them back in 20 or 30 years' time with ease on a common platform. But also what's quite exciting is you can then take that information and maybe use it in a different format. For example, you could do virtual walkthroughs of the backstage area or the, or the, the front of house area. Or you could do a con virtual conference where somebody is effectively looking as if they're standing from your stage, even though it's all happening in digital or an online world rather than actually physically happening within the space itself. So outside of just pure theatre, it unlocks an awful lot more potential. 
So finally, I'll just sum summarise, because I mentioned about Smart Stage, and I just thought I'd give you the opportunity to see what that actually is as a product, because it's effectively it's an LED volume that you can sit in. If we'd seen the video, it would have made far more sense, but it's it basically you, you, sit, you, you can stand in it, uh, present from it, and it uses something called extended reality. Um, and if anybody's interested in, in computer games and so on, they use a package called Unreal or Unity uh, to be able to generate an environment which effectively is added onto the real-time space that you have within the, the, uh, within the, within the, the, uh, the production volume. Um, and if you're interested in that in a little bit more, we've partnered with the uh, University of Portsmouth, who are doing some fantastic work with their exploratory stages that they've got in being able to uh, unlock the potential for the next uh, collaborator, the next technician, the next designer, to be able to use this style of technology to be able to bring that back into the creative arts. Thank you. I think it's interesting that you're talking about um, being able to bring shows back in 20, 30 years. We do that all the time here. So we've got um, storage down in Wales, which holds uh, 1,080 lorries worth of scenery which is full um, of shows which are up to 30, 40 years old, maybe even older. Um, so as they're revived with us, and you have them uh, in your rep. So, you, I mean, an opera house will always have one of, the, one of each of the big ones in its rep. We'll, uh, like, uh, we've, and with, with Bally as well. So we have to have a, a Swan Lake, a Cinderella, you know. Um, so as they come back and as they're revived, you're working from original paper co mm. copies, but now we're starting to be able to look at how we archive that diff differently. The other way that it really works for us as well in a practical term is co-producing. So we co-produce with a lot of opera houses around Europe particularly, sometimes further afield. To be able to share that information accurately between you without having to fly to each other's venues, and we all want to behave more sustainably as well, um, is a huge gain for us as well. So it's, it's only going to ramp up in the future mm, in, terms of, yeah. in terms of how we share that information. And I think it unlocks a huge amount of opportunity because from a skill set as well, yeah. we, as, we as practitioners of the theatre are needing different skill sets that perhaps we would have needed 20, 30 years ago. Certainly people that can do coding, people that can, are very fluent in 3D modelling, etc, etc. Yeah, so we're going to need all of you. We've got younger brains than ours. <laughs> to come and, and come and work with us and come up with the next ideas. Um, so yeah. Do you want a, is your video? Do you want to do yours? No, 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 no. So right now we can have some audience questions. If anyone has any questions, Michaela will be, be here with the microphones. We were talking about broadcast just now, weren't we? If while we're waiting for anybody to think of think of a question, and um, I think we live broadcast most of our productions here, and it's mm -hmm. it's just mushroom during. COVID, this, yeah. this was the way we started, you know, being able to keep our heads afloat. Um, and so I think the TV, film and, and theatre industries, which are very, very separate, we're now starting to see crossover skills. So we've got broadcast engineers on our teams that we wouldn't have had 10 years ago or 20 years ago and so on and so forth. So there's much more crossover and merging between. I don't think you have to choose one. You can move between a, a, a lot more these days. Yeah, totally. Uh, and like I was saying earlier, no, I'm predominantly a sound designer, but I had to learn new skills. But then there are people who you know, can transfer their skills quite easily, especially the new generation that's coming up. Because, you know, like Jason says, coding um, in the digital world, there's so much, that's their natural world. Um, so, yeah, there's so much transferable skills across all genres of, of arts and entertainment. Just a little fact, the, 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 um, the gaming industry is now uh, worth four times that of the music industry, and that's basically overtaken in the last 10 years. So if you look at that and then think about the number of people that are gaming, and therefore the number of people that are starting to develop skills and want to create the games themselves, effectively, once you start gaming, you're creating real-time worlds, mm. which is the type of thing we need in theatre and other areas of the arts. Yeah. Uh, do we have an audience question? Yes. My name's Phoebe, um, and I wanted to know how you thought this use of digital would impact the future of show planning. Um, how you know the use of visualization and everything like that is going to affect how we how we plan shows. How Evan was saying with the revival process and everything like that, um, will it get to a point? Do you think that we won't have uh, tech days and tech weeks and things like that because we'll have visualized it so much? No, no, I don't think it will. You've still got the um, because um, it's about. Um, 
Live theatre is about people, it's about storytelling, it's about emotions, it's about physicality, it's about how people work with one another and react to one another. It's the emotion of that moment. I was just in, in the uh, main auditorium and they're doing, they were doing a lighting session for a new opera called Alcina with Lucy Carter, who's the lighting designer. Um, and she was, uh, we, we were talking about the lack of time, we just finished the rehearsal, um, they finished about two-ish, and uh, we had a bit of a chat, and she said, even though we're going back to what looks like the same scene, emotionally the story has moved on, so what I'm doing doesn't look the same as it was on stage 20 minutes earlier. And she needs to feel that, she needs to see what that feels like, she needs to see what that feels like with real people and real emotions and the music, and to be able to sensitively change what she's doing in terms of, of the, the physical lights that are on at the percentage that they're on into creating a different emotional mood. And you can't do that by imagination. You've got to do that because you've heard the music, you can see the actors, and there's flesh and blood on stage. So it will help us hopefully create more time for the art. Does that make sense? It won't replace the art. So if we can carve out more time, then hopefully that allows our designers to play more um, and to have um, uh, to make decisions and to make changes and to, to be flexible and organic with what they're doing rather than take the time away from them. Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate what Emma has said because you know, I've uh, recently done a production of Legally Blonde um, at Regent's Park earlier this year and even though it was a revival of the original show, because the original show existed, it was easy to put it on um, but once you go into the rehearsal rooms, you can say, okay, we spent more time, like I say, for the art of changing it to bring it more up to date and more modern. We have a more diverse cast, um, and you know, the costumes were different, the dancing, dancing was different, music was the same, you know, the set was different, but it allowed us, because it's been done before, and they had a record of you know, um, plans and drawings, say, right, this is how it was done, this is how entrances happened. Um, it made it a lot easier putting it back on again you know, 10, 15 years later but with uh, updated cards and make it more re relevant. And that's the great thing about having um, uh, archives and plans is that it gives you the fun fundamental um, platform to then make everything relevant in the future. So, you know, so it's future-proof. Absolutely, no, great. It, it takes a lot of time away from the, the planning process, the, the early collaboration process. Um, and, and makes that much, much easier and takes a lot of those repetitive things. I didn't necessarily want to be having to send plans by FedEx every single day to make a, a change um, where I can now press, press a, a, send an email and effectively it comes back within 30 seconds or with a response saying, no, that's not what I thought sort of thing. So, you know, those sorts of processes, yes. But it unlocks a huge amount of new creative processes in allowing theatre not just to reside in the theatre, but also theatre to start breaking out into other areas of the cultural world and also exploring other areas of the digital world as well. Yeah, and, and, and directors are ambitious and designers are ambitious. And, and actually to have more tools to play with actually creates more work for us sometimes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, uh, more tools doesn't make it easier. More tools makes more work. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other audience questions? Uh, I was just wondering, with the bringing VR and AR into theatres, how accessible is that for people, particularly like if they're early career in theatre or maybe trained in other disciplines? Like, what sort of advice would you get people wanting to get involved in that? We're very early on in what's going to be an extremely exciting journey. Uh, if we, we pop back to 2007, and this was just released, the iPhone. Yet, we haven't a clue what we were going to do with the iPhone or the impact it has on our lives today. Um, whereas, so we're at that sort of point in that journey again, where we've got another five to ten years of exploring how consumers, for example, will start adopting that technology and we take the, the trends from uh, the, the consumer saying, we like this or we don't like that. And therefore, we start taking that I idea back into performance, back into theatre. So I think, you know, it, it's all about being open to new ideas now, being open to collaborate. Not necessarily always looking at theatre for what theatre traditionally has been, but theatre for its wider sense and how it can actually impact upon corporate events, how it can work within the music industry, et cetera, et cetera, because that's when it becomes really, really exciting. And you know, whether you might think oh, I'm only interested in theatre, but then somebody might be more interested in 
uh, a broadcast environment and want to try and take their ideas into that environment. And that's all very applicable and achievable now. I do think that if you want to make theatre and you want to work in theatre, you need to understand theatre as well. So, yes, have those tools in your toolbox. Um, we've, um, uh, our uh, Chief Technology Officer was talking to us recently about, well, we could green screen this, we could green screen that, and, and there was at some point the, the um, production director and I said to each other, but, but to what end? To what end? How does this benefit the live performance? How does this benefit us? So when you said we're at the beginning, we are at that beginning where everyone's very excited about it, but we also need to find that bit, that, that sort of Balance. the oil in the cogs of, of what, how that helps the live work as well. And, and we're still exploring that. We're at, we're, we're at a sort of threshold, really. Um, I think if you want to make theatre, then have the tools in your toolbox, have those skills, but don't expect it to be an entirely fully-fledged career yet because you might be at the forefront of the first generation that, that's doing this with us, but, but understand the theatre-making process as well, have, have those skills as well. Um, just having the digital skills isn't enough. You no. need to have the theatre-making skills too. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree. Um, and just touch what Jason was saying with, about trends. I mean, don't be afraid as early careers because most early careers, careers now know about TikTok, the metaverse, and you know um, all these social media platforms. The skills that you have and that you might think it's, they're not transferable, but they are transferable, if you know, especially if you know about theatre and you know the basics in theatre. Um, don't be afraid to set trends. You know, set the trend yourself. You know, how can you make it different um, by you know, having your basic theatre skills and marrying that with what you think may be a, you know, a, a normal skill that you have in using TikTok, for instance, platform. You know, there's always um, art to be made and theatre to be made out of any situation. So, yeah, don't be afraid to set the trend. We're always going to tell each other stories. Yeah. That's what we do. We, we've done it ever since we existed as a species. We tell each other stories um, about how to live, about morality, about um, what's right and what's wrong and what's punishable and what's guilt and what's death and what's murder and what's love. And all, this is what we do. We tell stories. Um, we are just um, finding different ways of telling them, different ways of projecting them, but the stories will always still be the same as well. So I think if you have a passion for the storytelling, um, then be flexible because theatre ultimately is flexible. It changes and mutates over time. Look, all the different... I work in a very traditional art form here in, in theatre and, and ballet largely. I'm um, sorry, opera and ballet largely. Um, but there are so many, so many different art forms out there and we all feed from one another and we all learn from one another. So, so keep an open mind, I think, really. Thank you very much. Are there any other audience questions? Hey, uh, hello, I'm Tiffany. I um, just want to ask a bit about, uh, can you shed a bit light like, on budgeting? Because the uh, visualization tools, they look massive in yeah, financial aspect. And how do you like recoup the investment or is it like a totally uh, funding thing and investment you have to look for? Me? I don't, I don't, uh, <laughs> it, there is an upfront cost, but then you, you start sharing that you start sharing that cost and recouping that cost in time saving, and the other 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 aspects of the production and the other opportunities that might come out of having that that uh, upfront asset at the beginning. So yes, it's an asset. You do need to invest in it. You need to invest in workflows, etc. But when you're starting to trim time off, maybe the production process or being able to sell more seats because you've actually been able to have a proper conversation about where the set sits in relation to the auditorium or charge slightly higher for seats because people have got better sight lines, then that in the end starts recouping in all sorts of different ways. Or for example, as one, one thing I heard or one thing with a project that we've been working on is somebody actually created a digital twin um, of their venue and then went out to their insurers and their insurance dropped. Uh, because basically they had an, a tangible asset that said I could build it as built and therefore the cost to rebuild would be uh, cheaper. Therefore, uh, on another department's budget somewhere, there was a line that said I can make a saving there. And I come from an organisation which is um, uh, nationally funded in part. There's donors and then there's box office. Um, and you don't always get back what you put in in terms of technology. You don't. Um, so it's... 
it doesn't necessarily gain you you're from much more commercial world where mm. you will invest in new technology and be able to hire and sell and all the rest of it. Um, we will uh, often have, so we're going to be uh, bulking up in terms of visualization because we're going to go to an LED rig. Now that's good because we're going to be saving energy, but it's not a sort of, you know, one pound in, one pound out. We, we, you know, we invest in visualization with an LED rig and then we get money back because we don't spend as much on electricity. It doesn't, it's not an absolute balance like that. So sometimes you do it because it's the right thing, sometimes because it's um, an artistic leap into the future. Um, so uh, often it's funding, it's, it's private funding or it's uh, philanthropic funding. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes it, it is people that are ambitious about new technology and want to invest in it and be part of that journey um, who might sponsor um, or might invest in something for us particularly, uh, for lots of uh, nationally funded or charitable organisations. So sometimes it's commercial, sometimes it's just the right thing to do and people will support that. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, I just wanted to ask, in like musical theatre and like live theatre and stuff, how do you think like the music and the sound design um, has changed with new technology? Like say, 10, 20 years ago, what do you think the main like differences are, um, and like how it's improved because of innovation and new ideas and new availability? I guess that's one for me. That's yours. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, the the biggest change has been the instant gratification of sound, as I call it. So 20 years ago, you used to, sound is coming from the stage, it was very much imaged to, if we are speaking on stage now, it felt like it was coming from me and it felt natural. So everyone was concentrating and listening. Now, because of technology, um, and mainly because of the digital age of TV, everyone expects sound to be here all the time, or ear pods, you know, you can blame Apple for that. You know, it's, you know, iPods as well. As soon as you put it into your ears, it's instantly there. And you can go to Spotify, you can change music. Oh, I want this. Don't want to listen to that. It's, it, it, you're in total control. So how that's translated to theatre, uh, modern day theatre now, is that not all shows, but majority of shows are like that now, um, especially directors, producers, they want that same feeling of being able to watch TV at home and have it all there. Or I want to change a channel straight away instantly. I want, you know, I want to be hearing everything. So um, technology's changed in terms of how many speakers we use now, um, how many radio mics we use. Everyone, everyone is on a radio mic now, even if they have one line in a show. It's, you know, musical theatre, everyone has a radio mic. The um, amplification um, has, has gone up as well level. It's just because the, the technology now is, because the technology is getting more efficient and, and smaller and lighter, you can cram a lot more technology into a building, a 150 euro theatre, than you would be able to do 20, 30 years ago. Um, so yeah, it's, it's audience members come in and they watch a musical and they want to be entertained. They don't want to see or hear any mistakes. It's very much because they're so used to watching Netflix and it's where everything's perfect or so-called perfect. You know, I mean, not everyone agrees with that approach. Um, um, I like to approach each production differently um, and, and look at the merits of what, what we're trying to put on. But you know, if the if the show calls for that, then that's the way we go. Um, if it doesn't, then you know um, we can't we can't hit we can't hit all our targets uh, with, with the same approach. Basically, I remember being in my previous theatre about 10, 12 years ago, and there was a sound check, and we'd recreated the show exactly as it was staged 20 years earlier. That's what the designer and director wanted, and I stood in the upper circle thinking, oh, I don't feel very engaged with this, this isn't... Then I realised that the entire image was coming from the stage, that all of the speakers were on the front of the stage, that the surround sound wasn't being used, and I wasn't as emotionally engaged with it, but I expected to be, because technology was, you know, over the last 20 years has kind of done this exponential curve in, in design and, 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 uh, and capabilities, and what we expect is, is much, much higher now, I think. 
just makes my job harder, basically. <laughs> I think that is one of the challenges now. You know, you see something on television or you see something mm. in a concert or whatever, and then you sort of start expecting that to be translated into all sorts of other areas of the cultural industry. And theatre being, being, being a prime one, um, the expectation of the, of the spectacle that perhaps you might get when you go to watch a musical because you've seen something similar on television. Yeah. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to yeah, ask? Yeah. I'll put questions down here. Um, basically, as somebody who's interested in like lighting design predominantly, but kind of I'm um, kind of doing a bit of everything at the minute as a venue technician. What kind of key piece of advice would each of you give to someone who's kind of entering that first, very first stage of kind of becoming a designer, whether it's a lighting designer or a sound designer? Just kind of what what tips would you give in terms of starting out? Um, I think know the tools know the tools so if if you're coming here and you've got very limited lighting time the ones that understand visualization and work better with visualization can make more of their time on stage does that make sense um, you can you can have more artistic time in the time that you're allotted if you've done all of that that prep work so it, it knowing the tools and knowing what the people that are working for you the programmers and so on and the visualization um, uh, programmers are doing and being able to work with them is is really key I think to maximizing your your abilities in terms of using your time efficiently, but also understanding the capabilities of, of the equipment as well. Um, so yes, artistic uh, uh, innovation and, and ideas are obviously key to what you do as a designer, but if you know the tools, it does open up new horizons to you, um, and it allows you to, to use your time efficiently and have more personal time for your own artistic endeavors when you're in the space. Totally, I agree. I mean, as a sound, if, you know, if you're going to anywhere, any designer, it's just soak up as much as possible um, from other areas of theatre um, or you know whatever genre you're going into. You know, from lighting, from automation, from from the music department, from costumes. You know, once you understand what everyone else does and how it, how you yeah. collaborate, it makes you a better designer. Um, and you know, and, and obviously. You was hear it all the time. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, you know. Um, specifically as a sound designer, listen to as many shows or music, podcasts, anything that is, you know, um, a oral sensation. Um, try, try, try and um, listen to as much as possible because it will inform you how you like things or what you, how you think things should be. It doesn't necessarily mean you're right, but everyone's individual. That's the beauty of art. Um, you know, everyone's got their own um, interpretation of what is good and what's not, and what you bring to the table might be, you know, what someone else is looking for compared to what I bring to the table. So yeah, um, don't be afraid to be creative within yourself and just listen and you know, just be a sponge, taking in all the information as you can. I've got two things. Uh, one is always seek the story. Um, as a lighting designer, you're still a storyteller. You're just using light as your medium to tell the story. And therefore, always look, whether, it, whether it's a simple production or whether it's a large-scale performance, an extravaganza, whether it's in theatre or out of theatre, just try and find the story and develop the story behind your work um, because that will, in, in, in effect, help you engage better with the audience and help you engage better and collaborate better with the actual um, uh, company uh, and your other collaborators in the creative team. And the, the second bit is treat everything like a pixel. Uh, because nowadays we're in a position where effectively we can control absolutely every light, every colour, every LED colour, etc. Et but also that's, that then uh, sort of merged the, 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 the transition between what is a light and perhaps what's a video projector into what's a screen, etc. Et and therefore you have the opportunity of being able to expand beyond perhaps more traditional stage lighting into other more immersive mediums. And also don't be afraid to push back against technology as well. Yeah. I know this is about... Yeah. Uh, technology but this is about you know uh, it's about art on stage as well your eyes are going to see a certain color differently from another designer's eyes build your own color palettes but do you know do that work with the technology but don't be led by the technology um yeah thinking about uh, hi my name is Sandra uh, so I was thinking about uh, the 
new era of theater with VR glasses and stuff like that. This is still called theater if it's in VR? Yes. Absolutely. I'm not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we are taking away from a live experience. That's really, really important. But it's extending an opportunity to a new audience. Only 500,000 people can sit in this auditorium and watch a piece of theatre and engage in a particular way. But you might also want to have a relationship in a different way with your online audience as well. And that opens up a new opportunity for you as an organisation, as, as a producer, as a director, to be able to reach out to them. It's definitely called theatre, uh, because we're telling a story. And that's, that's the backbone of everything we're doing. Also, I think what we found in COVID was that um, I was talking to a colleague, uh, somebody called um, Michelle Taylor, who works for Ramps on the Moon, which is a, um, a disabled um, theatre advisory company and theatre company itself. And... Um, and she sort of illuminated to me how many more people who were disabled had engaged with theatre during COVID because so much more, more was broadcasted. We, we broadcast so much, so many people broadcast stuff. Um, it can reach people who are economically disadvantaged, who do not have transport links to get to places, who uh, are physically uh, unable perhaps, or they've got caring responsibilities or whatever it might be. Um, it helps in terms of accessibility in so many ways for us to be able to share more widely. It doesn't replace the physical experience. Absolutely, it doesn't, because there's nothing like sitting in a darkened room amongst a whole load of your own species watching something on stage which makes you cry or makes you delight or makes you love or makes you whatever. Um, there is nothing to replace that, but it does allow us to reach in and embrace more people. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's helping in terms of access and... and uh, for us to share what we do, and sometimes that gives people a taster, so they might invest in coming to a live space, um, but it also allows us to reach people who might not otherwise have that experience, and I think that's, that's something we should always bear in mind. Mm. I think it's an, Im an amazing idea, anyway, the VR theater. <laughs> it's an, Im an amazing idea. Got time for one more question, if anyone wants. Mm, uh, if not, I think we have some questions. Um, okay. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who wants to follow in your footsteps and do what you're doing right now? Um, enjoy what you do. I mean, it's fantastic. It is a fantastic career path. I've done so many different things working in theatre. I've worked as a high-access rope technician. I've worked as a lighting technician. Um, I've toured all over the world. Um, I'm now here, which is a very privileged position to be here working in this extraordinary theatre where we produce the most enormous ballets and operas, but we also produce um, work in, in the Limbury Theatre here and, uh, and our community work as well, which is, which is again, another strand. Um, I'm privileged to have worked in, in other venues and, and, and touring. Um, I started off um, not really intending to do this at all. I worked in festivals and things like that because it was fun and it funded my studies um, and it kind of took off. Um, turn up on time, enjoy it, don't put your hands in your pockets, learn quickly, look for the next job, ask for something, um, but it is, it's an immensely... Uh, rewarding career and there's a huge amount of camaraderie and it's flexible you can change you can move you can adapt you can learn something new um, and it it does it does allow you to do that as well you you you're not pigeonholed it's it's great fun yeah I've, everything Emma says I'd also like to add just believe in yourself because um, no matter what background you are what, you know what class ethnicity your disability no matter where you come from see there is a place for you there is a place for you and you know um you, know, you might get knocked back, um, you know, or, or being told no, but there's always other doors that will open for you. So, you know, just believe in yourself and just keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on trying. Um, because, you know, even if you start off in one row, you know, it's not necessarily mean that you're going to end up in, you know, that's, that is you're going to be your career in that one row. You know, you will move within the theatre, you'll find, you'll find, you land on your feet and uh, you will find a place in theatre or the arts that you enjoy because ultimately you're doing it because you enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so just, just believe in yourself and you know, the opportunities will be there because you know, talent is talent at the end of the day. There's a fantastic clip on YouTube by um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, a uh, scientist who was asked in, in, um, 
in a, like a, a town hall forum, a young girl got up and said, um, is there anybody in science with dyslexia? And he just laughed and he was just like, there are so many of us with dyslexia. Um, but it is also worth noting that there's um, a lot of, of people that work in technical theatre with neurodiversity, uh, with dyslexia, um, and, and there is space and there is, is opportunity for so many people because we deal with people that work with crafts, with technology, um, who've got administrative skills, managerial skills, who have got physical skills, who are incredible uh, woodworkers or metal workers, um, who are incredible scenic artists. There is a, every range of person can find a space in theatre. So yes, there is, there is a space for everyone. Absolutely, I agree. I agree entirely with both those comments. You know, you've all got skills in you that either you're working on now or you don't know you have that will develop and they are totally applicable to the creative industries and theatre and being able to bring them out through whether it's technical, whether it's the uh, admin or creative side of the actual uh, industry. Um, you know, one of the other great things is just be a sponge. I use that term an awful lot as well. Just absorb as much as you possibly can. Don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to write to people. Don't be afraid to sort of turn up and just try and get, get yourself in because all of that, whether you're, whether you're being paid or not, that does, that's not... not, 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 you know, that's not uh, essential at this stage, but just get involved because once you get involved, then you have the opportunity of springboarding and making relationships. It's a partly a relationship industry, and therefore, start making those relationships early helps your career develop later. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that is a great place to end. Some great advice. Um, so, we would just like to say a massive thank you to Emma, Tony, and Jason for coming along today and mm -hmm. giving the talk. We hope that you guys have really enjoyed it as well. Um, if you have really enjoyed the panel today, um, we do have another one at four o'clock here in the Limbury Theatre, um, a super panel just to end the day. Th thank, thank you very, you very much, much for coming. Thank you.